Welcome to She Sells Radio. My guest today is someone I am so excited to bring to you who I know is going to demonstrate not only selling with ethics and integrity, but also is going to bring you some really incredible sales strategy that you can use to make fifty to $100,000 more this year at least. Now, who isn't excited about that? I know I am. And I'm going to read you his bio momentarily, and you'll be so excited because you're really learning from one of the best in the industry. Um, But for context, I will share that my guest today, Marcus Chan, is someone I met not too long ago as part of the Salesforce Top Influencers Program. And I just love getting to know him. And you'll also hear, I think, in today's interview, a lot of his heart, um, just really incredible human being all around. And so with that, here's his formal bio. So Marcus Chan is the founder of Benley Consulting Group. He helps account executives sell and earn 50 to $100,000 more each year through his coaching and training programs. Marcus is an official member on the Forbes Business Council and has also been featured in Forbes, Yahoo Finance, MarketWatch, and more. He has also been named as one of the top sales experts to follow by Salesforce and LinkedIn. And I wholeheartedly agree. Prior to this, Marcus was in corporate America for 14 plus years. And in that time, he worked for two Fortune 500 organizations and was promoted, listen to this, 10 times in 10 years with them. Talk about a fast track. And he's won countless awards, has been ranked in the top percentile every single year. In his last role, he led one of the top sales regions in the company with over 110 employees. Marcus lives in Portland, Oregon with his wife, Sarah, and his son, Roman. Marcus, welcome to She Sells Radio. So honored and excited to have you here, my friend. Well, I'm pumped to be here. You really put me on a pedestal here, so please do not. We'll have some fun today. I'm just a regular guy who's made a lot of mistakes in sales, and hopefully I can transgress some of my learnings to everyone that's listening. Yeah, well, I I think that's part of what I'm so excited about is your story and and really starting off with some of your backstory. You know, I was having fun going through your YouTube um, before this interview and you share some of your backstory of growing up, you know, really poor. And I think you mentioned even having fears of being homeless and kind of what you've created today where you were able to retire at age 35 and do what you love. So one of the big things that we talk about a lot in the She Sells community is how do we shift from scarcity to abundance mindset? Because I really think that's one of the keys that people don't talk about enough that helps grow sales. So can you share with us some of your backstory and kind of how you grew from this, you know, this child who was growing up poor and maybe af- afraid of not having enough to where you are today? Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and and thank you so much. And, and one of the things that was, was very interesting was it wasn't like I flipped a switch and suddenly overnight, I'm like, oh, scarcity to abundance. Um, you know, early on, just, you know, from a backstory perspective, so my parents immigrated here from uh, China and Taiwan. My dad came here, uh, you know, after he was put in a concentration camp during the Cultural Revolution. So eventually made it over here to absolutely no money, nothing, et cetera. So we grew up really poor. So eventually when they had the kids, you know, myself, my older sister, and later on my little sister as well, but early on, we saw how hard it was. We saw their struggle. We saw how we lived in a small town, working in a restaurant. Everyone had to pitch in to work to basically earn money. I saw how poor we really were. Now, it's interesting because, you know, growing up, you have these perceptions about certain things. And we grew up in a bad neighborhood, et cetera. And that was not great. And I knew we didn't have any money. But what was really interesting is, you know, because we were wired this way, like, you know, we had to be super scrappy and we all worked in the restaurant. As we got a little bit older, some of the the shifts started shifting a little bit over time with more perspective. Because a lot of times as a kid, you don't have any awareness. You're just like, whatever you see is, is your world. So when you see your friends getting cool new shoes, cool new clothes, cool new toys, and you're getting nothing and you're, you're wishing in more, you, you live in this world of scarcity. But what was really interesting is, um, and these are some lessons I don't think my parents realized, but they really hit home a little later on. But as we got a little bit older, they started to take us around the world and they started to take us to places in like parts of China or Taiwan that were like real poor. Like mm-hmm. I'm not talking about America poor. I'm talking about like, you know, really poor like shacks. And they take us to like Thailand. They take us to all these places where people legitimately were poor. They were living on maybe a dollar US a day. And when you see these type of places where people don't have a running water, they don't have restrooms, they're just like going going to the restroom in a hole in the ground, you start realizing pretty quickly you actually have it okay. So even though we were like, by America's standards, we were poor, we weren't like 
that type of poor. So that was some of the stuff. It starts kind of starts to uh, shift how you perceive the world, how you perceive money. Now, but still growing up, though, regardless, uh, you know, we all pitched in and I, we all worked really, really hard. I still grew up very, very worried about being homeless and all the and just being homeless and not having a home. And, and you know, if if the restaurant got robbed, which happened, I would worry about it shutting down and having them on the streets. Mm-hmm. Now. As I got a little older, you, you start feeling more comfortable. My parents started to build a little bit of you know, financial security. They're really smart with the money. I mean, basically, they were very cheap, right? So, um, but what happens when they're really cheap, you still have a scarcity mindset, yeah, <laughs> right? Sure. Like, I mean, like sure. it just, it, it, it didn't really, really shift. And I, I just remember, um, you know, I was uh, uh, 18 or seven, 17 or 18 years old, and my parents had a Chinese restaurant. We used to do these festivals on weekends in which we would go to sit up at a, at a uh, you know, like a park. And there'd be a big, you know, music event, whatever, for the weekend. We work 30 hours of two days and to make money. And I remember just being on my feet all day and, you know, slinging Chinese food noodles and uh, just like being exhausted. And it's like 1 a.m. I'm scrubbing pots and pans in the garage, preparing for the next day. And I remember my, my dad's like, you know, noticing my sour look at my face. And he's like, what's wrong? I'm like, well, I hate this. I hate, like, I hate that, you know, like, I hate, like, I, you, we have more money now, but I hate it with the work so hard for our money. I hate that. I feel like literally, we're literally on our feet all day. Like I'm, I'm dirty. I'm oily. I'm greasy. Like I want to go. But my friends are out partying, doing whatever. I, I want to do that. And he's like, "Well, you know, my dad's like, this is like, this is how it is. You have to earn, earn your keep, etc." And I'm like, and I told my dad at that point, I'm like, one day, I want to be in a position where I make money with my brain. Like it's not about necessarily hard work, which I'll always work hard, but can I do what's in my brain to actually generate money? I didn't know how. The point I was just was like, I was just like. I'm like, I was, I was just sick of like physically trading time for money, physically being tired all the time. Mm-hmm. So that was like these mental shifts. Now, what was also interesting too, as we, as we start to, as my life starts to transgress a little more, I start, my, my mindset still is very poor, still very like scarce. And um, the biggest trend, the next big shift was probably when I was 22, 21, 22. And uh, I, I started B2B sales. So now I'm like, I'm like, cool. I graduated college. I'm like, this is my vehicle. This is the way I'm using my brain to make money. This is an opportunity here. I'm, I'm going to help build up the startup business. And, and, you know, it'll be really cool. I'll make money. And now, now I'm using like this, which was between my ears. Hmm. And it was really hard. I thought it'd be easy. It was really hard. And I really struggled and I was doing absolutely terrible. And I remember um, I was worth the worst worst rep in the company. So I'm going to talk to my what mentor was hard about it for you. I, I want to just pause and ask because people, they hear your yeah. credentials, they hear what you've done. And they're like, yeah. well, he's been a pro his whole life, but what, like, tell us a yeah. little bit more about the struggle there. I think that's important for sure. So, uh, th- th- so before I got to this point, you know, I, I kind of skipped ahead for from, from time perspective. Um, I had a few different other jobs, right? So like, you know, uh, you know, I worked in a retail store selling speedos, right? And yeah. speedo accessories. I was competitive consumer growing up. I love hearing the backstory uh, yeah. of like what people sold way back yeah. then. It's always yeah. hysterical. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> it was awesome, right? But it was also like people were coming in. So the retail environment, people coming in and you're selling them, right? Mm. Uh, you know, working in restaurants, then people come in and you sell them food. Uh, and then at one point I was working for uh, a rental car agency and we're selling insurance. People come in, we sell them insurance, we upgrade them the car. So there was like, that to me, that, that there was some selling, but it wasn't like being able to convert a c- complete stranger to paying cash or credit card or a PO in, 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 a, in a situation. And now I was in a, in a situation where there's no inbound. It, it was mm-hmm. a brand new startup to, um, we had no inbound. The economy started falling apart. This is 2007. Uh, and it was completely cold B2B. So mm-hmm. prospect to close. So, it, which is very different someone walking in saying, hey, I'm already planning, I'm already planning to spend money. As long as you don't mess it up. <laughs> okay. Right. So, oh my gosh. Totally. Yeah. It's so fun. Our stories are so similar. I started B2B selling 2007, 2008 as well. Yeah. Like right around that. So yeah, yeah, I'm so with you. Oh man. So, yeah. so now it's like, it was like number one was prospecting. So like mm-hmm. I really struggled with product, like being able to generate meetings was on the phone, email, even door to door to businesses. That was really hard. Um, and then being able to have a sales conversation, like being able to, to truly do an effective discovery. Like I just, I didn't really know how to do that with a cold prospect because they're really just not interested at all. So th- those are all those little things. I just, well, first of all, I didn't know. I didn't know. I was like, I can't book meetings. Now I can't close. Those are my big, my two big issues. And, um, and in having somewhat decent success in which in the other roles I did, but basically I was able to just outwork everybody. Mm. And I was like, okay, I, was, I did pretty well um, to now to this where, yeah, hard work's for sure. Part of being, being effective in sales, but that was only one piece of the equation. 
it, it was like, uh, you know, like there's a whole recipe to be successful in sales. And yeah, I had one ingredient, <laughs> hard work, <laughs> but I missed the other core ingredients. Uh, and that's what it was. Um, but I didn't know, I, there, was, there, was, there was many things from uh, strategies to know, tax to know, but also mindset. That was a big one. And I, I'll give you a really good example. So I remember this is like, um, this is now about probably this is a few few weeks and maybe even a month in or so. Um, and I, I definitely outworked everybody. There was just zero question about that. Uh, I only had two suits that I wore. Um, and I wore a, I would switch off every other. It was a full suit, shirt and tie type environment. Mm-hmm. So I would wear, I, would, I had five white dress shirts. Uh, and I had these two suits and I, I would wear the same ones every other day. I wore them every single day. And I know basically over time, because we're in Oregon, we're right, wearing things out and I'm on the field. I'm literally cold calling my foot. I'm on the, I'm like, we're, we're destroying mm-hmm. our suits and our clothes um, within, a, within like, you know, within a few weeks or even over a month. I mean, like my suit is like wrecked. It looks terrible. And I'm, I'm, I'm not making any money. So I'm not taking a dry clean. It. Like I'm just like, you know, steam it in the shower. Yeah, you know, get, a, get, a, get a lint, a lint, uh, lint roller. Uh, all, all my white shirts, like uh, it was summer when I started, was was turning yellow around the collar and gray. Oh wow! Um, and, yeah. and I kept trying to kept trying to bleach them to keep them like white, mm. and, and it just made them more like see through. All right, so oh, it's, my like, gosh. it's like and like my shoes were like. I first got wooden soles because I thought it looked, looked nice, and they got destroyed by the concrete because I'm literally pounding. Pain. I'm literally cold calling my foot. Like my first week, I walked into 120 businesses by foot. So like I was destroying my shoes, like everything else. So I was like a hot mess. And uh, I'm, just, I'm talking to my mentor. I'm complaining about everything. I'm like, oh my God, everything is absolute. Like it's like prospects are, are cheap. They don't have any money. Like the economy is bad. Everything's shutting down. And, uh, you know, like, like my clothes are getting destroyed. And, uh, and, and my, my mentor looks at me. And he's like, he like stares at me. I'm just like. Barry, Barry, he's, he's like looking look me up and down. He's like, you're right. You're right. Uh, you look like a mess. Mm. I'm like what? He's like, yeah. He's like, yeah, you're, you're, you look like trash, man. Like your suits trashed, like your, your shirts trashed. Like you look basically look like, look like I was homeless. Right. Mm. So, yeah. And, uh, and I was like, wow, well, you know, but, but here, here's the thing, Bill, like I'm not making any money. Like, so how can I, I'm not closing anything. So how can I go? and invest in like new suits, or whatever. And like, you know, and, and buy these things if I don't have any money. And I remember he looked at me and he said, if you're not willing to invest in yourself, how do you expect someone else to invest into you? Mm. And that was like, yeah. I was like lights out. I mean, it was not like, it was like an aha. And mm. at that point I realized you sell how you buy. Mm. And at that point I realized because I had this par- part of the issue I was dealing with, I had this poor mindset because I was so scarce in mindset and I was so cheap in how I was thinking, even how I would ask questions and how I carried myself, there was no confidence. There was, yeah. I, I, I showed a lot of scarcity. So for example, if, if I was going to a prospect and I was trying to sell them into a $3,000 a month, you know, offer, like I wasn't able to say it confidently. Hmm. It would be yeah. like, so it's um, three thousand dollars a month. That's okay. You know, I mean, it was probably worse than that. But you can't. You my point. Like when, in a prospect is going to feed off your confidence, right? And it was all these little things and all these um, uh, unconscious insecurities that would come out and how I communicate with prospects. I want to because that's so- scarcity mindset. Yeah, and you just said so. It's like my mind is sitting here, just wheels turning because I don't know that I've. I've been in the sales space for a long time. I've been in the coaching space for a long time. I don't know if I've ever, maybe it just hasn't hit me this way, but like you sell how you buy. I feel like there's so, there's so much to that. Mm -hmm. So what you're saying, and tell me if I'm understanding is like you mentioned before, if you want to invest in you, why won't somebody else invest in you too? Right. But it's like Mm -hmm. the confidence level. If, you know, if things are, we've got entrepreneurs listening to this show, we've got commission sales reps listening to this show, like in the months where things are tight, are you, or maybe you're having a down month versus like, are you leaning in? Are you investing in yourself more Mm -hmm. because you understand the flow of money and you understand the power of your mindset? Or are you shrinking back? Like, is that what you're saying? Can you tell us more? I just feel like that was such a mic drop moment. I I want to hone in on that. Yeah. So, um, oftentimes, you know, our actions are in alignment to our beliefs, our true beliefs. So if if we if we ourselves are really cheap in everything that we spend spend money on, it's very hard for us to portray value to someone else. 
Because if, some, if a prospect says to you, well, that seems a little expensive, if you're naturally cheap, you might be like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> like, uh, you know, yeah, e yeah. E even though you try to say, no, 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 you need this uh, because there's a misalignment here. But when you truly actually learn to sell from abundance and you are actually indifferent to what they do and you you, you actually like when, when, they, when they say, uh, wow, it seems too expensive, you mentally should be shocked. You're like, that makes zero sense to me because I know the ROI. I see the value. Uh, and we, we I, I see this a lot, especially when someone transitioned, if they were some, maybe something more transactional or maybe a small, maybe a smaller, a smaller offer, smaller solution, or they were selling to maybe, you know, the small mid-sized businesses. And then it's maybe a little more transactional and they go into selling enterprise, really big opportunities. They themselves then struggle with that jump of mm. ha having that alignment with themselves because they themselves are just too cheap. Right. Yeah. So, and that's where it's like, um, it, because ultimately, if you're especially in the B2B world, if you're selling something of value to them, it's a little bit of an ROI of some sort. When you when you truly believe that, then it, it you, they can hear in everything you say and, and everything that you do. Mm, and yeah. when you hear objections, there's no like, if someone says that's too expensive, that's more than I expected. There's no like, oh, but let me uh, let me see if we can get you a discount. It's like, right. We know this is the best solution to, to offer you. This is what you need. It's going mm. to deliver an ROI. Yeah. So that level of conviction transfers all the way through. But if you yourself are really, and when I say talk about it, you know, being like cheap, it's like across the board, right? It's across the board, right? And that's where when you start, when because there's some people say, well, you know, I'm really cheap in this, but also spend money on this. It makes sense. Mm. Like, for example, like, um, you know, like I'm pretty, I'm pretty cheap actually still. Like I buy my shirts in bulk. There are $7 shirts I buy in bulk still, right? Yeah, yeah. But there are certain, I absolutely, I love technology. <laughs> like mm, I'll, buy, I'll mm -hmm. buy new tech. That's like my thing, right? But everything else, I'm super cheap. People are like, oh my God, you really the same thing every day. I'm like, yeah, but because I don't see value in that. It's what you value. Yeah, I get what that. you value. I get so that. So if you if if had a mindset, then suddenly when, you, when your actions align with your beliefs and you actually truly are doing those things, you will sell at a higher level. But yeah. it, it takes training your mind to think that way, oh, right? And it's, it's yeah. the same way with income as well, because if you mentally have a self-concept that you, you yourself are only worth $80,000 or maybe that's your goal, and once you get there, then you're like, whoo, even if you saw, if you got there half the year, you might be like, well, now you can take it easy. Yeah. So learning yeah. to increase that self-concept to a higher level will push you to achieve more. This is actually why it's so key to actually have big goals that are tangible that you break down. Otherwise, you'll get stuck by your self-concept, what you expect of yourself. Yeah. I love everything you're saying. This is everything we believe in, in She Sells World. So this is so good. So thank you. I, I wanted to like hone in on that because I just felt like, yeah. gosh, that's, that's, that's <laughs> food for thought for sure yeah. for me too. But so take us, so your mentor looks at you and he's like, if you wouldn't, like, if you're not going to invest in you, why would somebody else? So what shifted yeah. for you from that point? Yeah. So it was, was, what's very interesting is like, um, I think words are powerful. Because even the words he, he mentioned there, um, he didn't say spend money, you know, he said invest. And there was like, there's some epiphanies there. And when you think about this, when you, when you say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to spend money this or someone invest into this, it's a big, big mental transition. So I was seeing new clothes as an expense. Mm. I was seeing these things at expense. What I didn't really see them as was an investment into actually the version myself. It's really asking yourself, what would the best version of myself do right now? Mm. And the best version would invest in myself. And it didn't mean like go crazy and go insane, but it was like, okay, what I'm going to go do? Let me go buy some, let me actually look the part. Let me look the part. And that way I can actually like, you know, like have more confidence, look good and feel good. Because at the end of the day, when you actually feel good, you're going to sell better. That's just reality. So I, I literally, the, exactly what I, I literally went and spent three thousand dollars on new suits, new shirts. New, I think I got like four or five new. They weren't expensive, like four or five new suits. I got like like five or seven dress shirts, a bunch of ties. You know, it's like a bunch of socks, a bunch of like shoe. I, I maximized as much as I can. I went to like a Burlington Coat Factory. <laughs> I love and, it. Yeah, yeah, I got as much yeah. as I could, so that way I can at least you know look the part. And that was like, but that was like one of, one of the first like kind of steps, if you will, of that, that transition. And, mm. and over time you start doing different things. Like for example, like I ended up investing to like a Tony Robbins conference later that year. That was a big thing for me as well. Um, just, you, you start realizing like, Hey, this is like, if I, if I want to actually 
live in abundance, I have to take the steps to help me live in abundance. And were you selling more at this point when you started investing in other things like Tony Robbins or kind of tell us what started to shift that flow? At that that point, I still wasn't there yet, but Mm, I invested anyways, right? Because um, it was, it was work, it was was uncomfortable, right? So one of the things was like, first off, I started to train my mind different ways. So I started like consuming different things and eliminating things that didn't serve me. Right. Mm-hmm. So like I stopped, I stopped listening to the news. I stopped listening to friends that didn't, that, that weren't part of it, you know, that weren't going to raise me up. You know, I stopped listening to anyone that was, a, a, you know, anyone who did basically was negative. Uh, I started consuming books nonstop and like audio books, tapes, whatever. Tony Robbins, Zig Ziglar, Brian Tracy, you did all, all the classics, right? Just to like get myself in the right mind space. And, and that's what, that's what I really realized. I'm like, if, if I really want to become the best version of me, I need to fill my head with the right things, right? Mm. So that was things like a Tony Robbins. Even if I couldn't afford it, I knew it'd be an investment for my future, right? It's at this point, like I, I, I read every single Tony Robbins book. So I'm like, all right, he he knows what he's doing. He's pretty successful. I'm sure I probably glean something from it, right? And that was powerful for me. Just like it, it, that was hard to do. It was hard to do because it was like eight, I think it was eight grand at the time for the seats I wanted. That was mm. a lot of money for me at the time. So I'm like, oh my god, like, yeah, it, it wasn't like there was no like. It was it was just a, it was just a, it was just a weekend thing. It was there was no like there was no coaching, no course, nothing. There was no like no, I think I, I had a workbook from it maybe. <laughs> like, wow. And is it just is it framing decision? I want I want to hone in on this. Was it just the continuing to frame the decision of what would the best version of me do Correct. in this point? Because I think that's such 100%. a powerful takeaway from this. Hundred yeah. percent. It was mm. what would the best version of me do right now? The person who has achieved every single thing I want in my life. What would they do right now? Because oftentimes that. the actions we take are purely based off who we are right now. Mm. But if you want to become the best version of ourselves, what decision would they make? And ultimately, as Tony Robbins said, our destiny is formed in the decisions we make. So if we understand that to be true, we have to make better decisions today, even if there's no immediate gratification on the spot. So we start thinking like long term about how, like, what could I do right now to help, my, help myself down the road? You start making, making different decisions. And over time, they compound over time and each thing adds to it. So like even from the scarcity to abundance mindset, there's still things I still like struggle with, right? So mm. for, for example, like, you know, we're looking like, you know, we're probably gonna get a, another new car. We're like, should we get the new Model S? It's 120 grand. And I'm like, it's hard for me just buy a car. Like, I, I like cars, yeah. but like, do I want to spend six figures on a car? Like, can we afford it? Yes, but do I want to? I don't know if I could drive value from that. You know, mm. so there's certain things still where it's like, I have a certain level of like, value cap. I'm like, that's not worth it to me. <laughs> you know? I, and it's, like, good, but it's good to be aware of that stuff. Right. Too. So I appreciate right. you saying that too, because right. I don't know that this stuff ever ends and it's not saying that you should, or you shouldn't buy the car, but it's like, what would the best version of you do? And every time we elevate, there's another best version of ourselves that we get right. to connect with and stretch to. Right. hundred percent. hundred percent. Yeah. I think also just surround yourself with people who are doing, doing things bigger than you. That was big too. Mm. Like just be like me and the people um, that just are just playing the game way, way bigger. It's like, it, it opens your eyes. It really opens your eyes. So for example, um, you know, I'm in a, I'm in a pretty, pretty big mastermind. You know, I paid $50,000 to be part of this mastermind. And we had an event a few weeks back and I'm at this event. And I'm talking to other entrepreneurs and some of them are doing 500,000 to a million to 2 million, 3 million each month. Mm. And I'm like, dang, I'm just a little guy on this pond here, right? Like, I'm like, I'm like, but it forced you to like to level up yes. because it's very inspiring. It's like, okay, this is very inspiring seeing what they're doing. They built an online business this way. All right, cool. I could, I got, I got some ways to go. I got some ways to go, but it, it, te- it, te- it teaches you to break free some of these limitations that you, we, we just naturally have being a human being. Oh, for sure. And it helps you raise yourself. In. It helps you kind of raise That's that it. set point, right? That financial That's set right. point of what's normal and what's, cause we'll always kind of default to what we've seen previously and who we're surrounded by. So right. I love, I love that you're doing that. So, okay. So keep, so keep going. This is, this is so inspiring to me. I'm cool. like, I feel like I'm cool. pulling gold out all along the way cool. in the story. So, yeah. So, uh, so, so, uh, so, uh, so I went to corporate America and what's interesting is, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I, that was the first big, kind of big, big, like, aha. Uh-huh. Right. And over time, you start to earn more, 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 more. And remember, it got to the point where it's like in the pond I was at, the, the comp- conversation wasn't that good. Right. So, like, it was really hard to break into multiple six figures because of the way the comp was, was designed. So, I'm like, okay, so I'm going to have to like go into a new pond. Even though it's a big company, the company was like a $20 billion company. The way they set it up was like, it was, there's limits. So, I'm like, I had to go somewhere else. 
right? So eventually I made, I made a switch to another company and then, you know, and they're getting promoted multiple times as well. But then you, you, you start like being surrounded by other people who are producing at a higher level. So that was also, again, key. And the whole time I'm like, I'm like learning and I'm studying and I'm improving my game the whole time. And um, uh, I remember at this point, it was probably 2015. And this is where it, it kind of turned into, it basically it took, uh, it, it went from like me doing my own thing, uh, you know, being uh, in a, a corporate America and then starting to dabble into a side hustle. Mm. Now, at this point, I never wanted to be an entrepreneur. I didn't, I never want to do what I do right now. I never, um, never wanted a side hustle. That wasn't really, I, I saw how my parents were entrepreneurs. So in my mind, my, my frame of my, my frame of mind or concept of entrepreneurs, they work their tails off and they don't make the money they want to make, mm. you know, super appealing. Well, super appealing i'm like cool awesome like because they had a restaurant they had they had to physically yeah. be there i'm like cool live there like seven days a week always work around awesome life i don't want that at all yeah. right no, so thank you. um at, at this point though i remember like because I, I had been promoted um about uh 10 times now this it was it ended up being like 12 times in the 10 years but it's that's not as cool as 10, 10, 10, 10 out of 10 sounds better. So anyway, so, uh, I <laughs> it's was a like, lot okay. either way. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's a lot either way. So, so I'm like, okay, I'm like, well, so people can ask me, Hey, how did you do this? I'm like, do what? I'm like, I don't know. They're like, how did you get promoted so many times? How do you like, like, how do you seem to have this like Midas touch? I don't think your touch seems to have results. I'm like, that's not true at all. Like I fail all the time. Mm. They're like, but how did you get promoted that many times? I'm like, I just work hard. I'm like, no, how did you really do it? You should write a book or something. I'm like, okay, I guess I could. But you know, I just I just got promoted again to another role. I had a team of eighty five employees and nine sales leaders reporting to me. I'm like, let me let me learn how to write an ebook. This is before people like before everyone their mother had an ebook. So I'm like, yeah. well, okay. So I remember I bought an online course to learn how to write an ebook. This is like my my first taste in like online courses because they still weren't that big back then. Like mm-hmm. only like the the influencers online had it, right? So I'm like. Let me just buy this online course on how to make a, an ebook because I didn't know how like how do I set up a web page? How do I take payments? How do I do all these things I didn't know? So uh, I learned how to do that, and I wrote this book, e- ebook, and uh, and I remember I just put it out there uh, on Instagram, and I made ten dollars in an hour. I'm like, oh my guys made ten dollars! So Amazing. exciting, though, right? It was it's like incredible. Oh yeah, it, it, I know that. Feeling. It was it was yeah. it was a wild. I still have an email. I still have it. It was the wildest feeling to me because I was like, oh. I didn't have to get on a sales call. Oh, that was yeah. strange. Some strangers gave me money. I mean, 95 and PayPal, that's very interesting. So I, I was like, that's cool. So I eventually like, that's neat. And you know, I was making a couple hundred dollars a month of that thing. That was, that was kind of fun. And, um, but that was like, that was like the doorway to open to even go to, to open the mind to more abundance, right? I was like, mm. hey, what else could I do? What else, what else could I create to make this like passive income, if you will? And, at the time, again, online courses weren't as big. I'm like, I should build an online course. Now, everyone, the mother has one today, but at the time, it wasn't like, again, it wasn't that big of a thing. So I'm like, okay. So I bought a different program. Again, this is like my first time exchanging money online for like some stranger. I'm like, all right, well, $1,000. Let me, let me learn how to build an online course. <laughs> pay, pay this guy $1,000 online. It was a great program. I learned how to build it out. It took me about two years because at this time, I was still traveling nonstop. Um, Big sales org at the time, it grew to 110 plus employees, and I was in a hotel room about 100 nights a year, and it was it was insane. So, anyway, so um, in my free time, uh, <laughs> I, I built I built an online course, and I didn't know what to build, what to make. So, uh, at the, early on, I'm like, what, what are people asking like questions on? I'm like, everyone asking questions about B2B sales, like stuff I think everyone should know. Mm-hmm. I'm like, let me build an, a B2B sales course. So I just built my first one. It took me two years, and I remember like this is January 2019. I'm like, crap. What if I just wasted two years building this out? Nobody buys it. Oh wow! I'm like, oh my god! I gotta, I'm like, whatever. Let me just add my email list. Very small. I didn't know how to really build an email list, so it was like yeah. 300 people on the email list. Just email them. No real logic. Like, hey everyone, <laughs> just say, here it is. <laughs> here it is. See what happens. Uh, <laughs> but I woke up and made two thousand oh, dollars, and that was I like, wow, holy smokes! And again, this is like, if you notice, each each micro experience is like opening my mind to what's possible. Mm, yeah and that was really really neat i'm like wow this is like something i can really build and scale out and i got to this point where i'm like i'm like well i don't want to just quit and just roll out i, I gotta be more strategic about this right because on while i'm doing this, this whole thing while i'm doing this i'm also like getting really exposed to this online world mm. uh, of, of how people make money online because it, as a as a corporate employee 
you know, it's, it's, it's like, yeah, I was, I was making a lot of money. Um, and you know, my team was as well. You get, you get, you get stuck in a frame of mind, like, okay, cool. Like the caps are about seven figures. Right. Oh, that makes sense. But then you start like in this online world, you start learning people or some of them making seven figures a month, mm-hmm. seven figures a week, seven figures in a day. I'm like, mm-hmm. how's that even possible? It starts really open, expand your mind of like, wow. Like, it, cause it, in, in my mind before that, it was like, you can only make that much money. If you uh, have like a huge business, you have hundreds of employees and do all these things, or you have to be in, a, in the C-suite to get to the, the absolute you know, crazy next level. I'm like, that's what I thought. But now I was getting exposed to a world where these are like, I would see 25 year olds who are making absolute killing online. Like this is, this is possible, right? This is, this is really neat. And I also got to a point where, because I'm so cheap and I'm, I'm really good with my money, like I was like, I could just quit my job and just stop working and just focus on this if I want to, right? I don't have to work if I want to. But I'm like, let me kind of time this out. So I kind of timed it out because I still had like, I had a, I had a presence club trip in the summer. And like nine months later, I was in the summer. I wanted to get my free trip. It's five-star resort. I had a bunch of stock. I was going to invest. I wanted my stock. I wanted to cash out my stock. So I waited all these things happen. Nine months later, I cashed out and then I rolled out and started and start my business in September 2019. And mm-hmm. it's been a really neat journey because as I continue to have just interact with more entrepreneurs, other really successful people like yourself, it opened my mind even more and more and more to what's really possible out there. But that's probably uh, a long story. A long story short, each of these micro experiences have continually opened my mind. And we mm-hmm. had to actively choose to chase them. And it, it can be uncomfortable, but that's actually where all the growth comes. Oh my gosh. Well, it's like all throughout. I, I love that because I feel like we got so much mindset gold there, like all throughout the journey there was the pushing the comfort zone and pushing, yeah. pushing your, your mental limit from yeah. investing in the suits, right? 3000 yeah. bucks in the suit to yeah. the Tony Robbins yeah. to yeah. like investing in creating a course and, and just continuing to kind of raise the threshold of, um, of how you view yourself, yeah. which to me is, 80 to 90% of the game in sales success, right? Is like, how do you view yourself? What's your self image? Cause you're never going to outperform that. So I love all of that. I think there's so many places we could go from here, but I want (laughs) to, one of the things I know I want to do because you're like, you're brilliant at all things sales process, like just from going into your content. And by the way, like we'll link this in the show notes, but check out Marcus's YouTube, check out, we'll link his website, his LinkedIn. There's so much that I've learned too, just like going through your content. We're like, oh, he did that so well. So, so you've got so much great content out there on the sales process. We're not going to have time to get into all of it now, but for me, a couple of things stood out to me that I think our audience would love. One is, can you talk about, um, you speak to like video prospecting and video outreach. Can you give us some tips for that? Cause to me, I'm all about how do we do things differently? How do we stand out? I think video is, is just one of the best tools we have today in sales. What are some of your tips for, for video outreach? Cool. You teach? So yeah. you want to talk about a peer outreach or a contact? Cause there's two different strategies there. Ooh, I don't know which one you, you pick, you tell us which one you think is more impactful. So, uh, so I'll, I'll talk about outreach because, um, you know, doing content is a long game. Right. Yeah. So you don't, you don't, you don't typically see the immediate like ROI, right. Yeah. It just takes a little, little bit of effort to get into. So, so the couple of things. So um, what's important to understand is, you know, video. So in today's world, everyone gets emails, cold, direct, direct messages, cold calls, et cetera, nonstop. Um, where do the attention goes? Money flows. So if we're able to capture more attention in you know, using like video, you'll really stand out. And in today's world, because there's so many sales tools out there, a lot of people will just try to automate everything. And I believe automation has its place for sure. Like we use automation too, but if you can add in personalization on top of that and just use both in the right way, it can really help you stand out in a really, really effective way. So uh, let's, use, let's just use a very tactical example. So let's just say um, LinkedIn. LinkedIn's a really great tool to use. So if you understand um, LinkedIn, your first off, before you even do any type of video, if you want to increase your conversions, you have to really think about your ICP, ideal customer profile, and what they're thinking about. So mm-hmm. if you were to just um, just connect with someone that you don't know, that you believe is going to be a good prospect, and you send them a video message, it may or may not convert, right? There's many things that can't go to, which we'll cover in a second. So if you want to increase conversion, I'm going to go super hyper-tactical and go step yeah. by step. So the first thing you want to do is you want to optimize your LinkedIn profile. Mm-hmm. Because the cool part, while about LinkedIn is, if you send someone a message, the first thing to do is check out your profile. 
So if you do a good job of their profile, it will actually sell them on a couple of things. It'll sell them on number one, that you're not a spammer. Okay? Mm. Uh, at, at number two, that you'll be of value to them. So that's really, really powerful. So you can, you can use this as a sales tool. So that means everything from your headshot to your cover, your uh, your banner, to your uh, your headline, to what links you have, to the content you post, to everything you have beneath the fold. As you scroll down on your page, it, it, can, it, it should only sell one thing, that you can help them and bring value to them. Mm. That's really it. And whatever specific thing you're, you're selling, all right? So by just doing that, you, you already have the game. And then of course, obviously, if you do like a lot of content too, they'll probably check out your content, make sure you're actually legit. And if your content's really good, it'll nurture them as well. So that, this way they're more open to it. So, so step one, before you send out messages, optimize your profile so it's it's designed to convert. All right, that's, that's what we want to do, okay? So the next, now you can, let's say you can do outbound. So there's a couple of different approaches you can do. So depending on where the lead source comes from. So whether you go into LinkedIn Sales Navigator and you're building a hyper-targeted list, you're connecting people and you're messaging them. Or if you are uh, putting content out there, you're doing attraction marketing and people are commenting and then you're sending, sending connection requests, you're sending them a message, you can do the same 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 thing on the way. Now, so first thing I do is, um, so we send a connection request. And if you're gonna send a connection request, I, I always recommend, number one, um, it has to be hyper-personalized. So it's really clear it's not automated. Yes, amen. Or, Thank you. Or <laughs> don't have a message. So if you can't make it personalized, don't have a message. Interesting. Because because it'll actually hurt you if you put something really general. So if you, if you, cause, cause people are, people are super skeptical, right? So what happens is when you don't put a message in there, it taps into FOMO if you're missing out and mm. makes them curious. It makes them more apt to accept it. Now, if you had to stack it, what, what has a higher conversion from connection request to, to them, them accepting it? A personalized message always stands out more. But if you're not sure, maybe like they just don't have that much on their profile and you're like, crap, I don't want this seems super generic. Then you're better off with number two, which is leave nothing. Right? I've never heard it, but it makes so much yeah. sense. But yeah, to the yeah. canned spammy audit, like I hate those. I don't respond to those. We so, see it. Great point. So, yeah. Here's a funny side note. So uh, in my LinkedIn, it says Marcus A. Chan. I don't have a middle name. The A stands for automation. Some people use what? automation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> this is how I know. So they send me messages like, hey, Marcus A. I'm like, okay, automation. Like, oh, that's, how I, that's how I know. Oh, interesting. There. Yeah, oh, you, my you, gosh. Yeah. You just is, take your first first name, add a, add a middle name. I saw some people add <laughs> emojis right in there because if they have emoji in there, then you know, you're like, all right, these automation. So interesting. Little, 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 little ninja hack. So anyway, so um, uh, you, you send connection requests, right? Whether you, it's hyper-personalized. Yeah. It should be like, like imagine like, like, it, people love to have their ego stroked. If you can make them feel good, they're probably gonna accept it. Yeah. If it's like, hey, Elise, I, I just I just saw your uh, your interview with Marcus Shan on the She Sells podcast. That was really really insightful about LinkedIn. Hoping to connect here. Mm. You're probably gonna accept that person now because you, now you feel good. They clearly did their homework. They're not just like some random person. Even if they just literally clicked on the your your you know click on Spotify, listen to one second. <laughs> You don't, right. they don't, you don't know. You're just like, oh, that was, that was already, already had the game. So cool. Absolutely. So then, then, then they accept it, right? And then, um, and then the cool part is if you, if you do have a personalized note like that, uh, even if that prospect doesn't, doesn't respond, once they accept it, it's going to show up in your inbox. Mm. So now you know you can follow up. It's a, it's, a, it's a trigger to follow up. Super, super simple, okay? Now, if you don't have a message and then you connect your request, it's not going to show up. So then you just have mm. to kind of monitor it. So... Then from there, um, there's a couple of different approaches you can do with video. Now, I'm all about giving first because if you leverage the law of reciprocity, reciprocity, whatever, however you say it, reciprocity, yeah, 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 reciprocity. Yeah. Then if you give something first, they're even more likely to respond back. So mm. I have to give some value up front. All right. So um, now this uh, video takes uh, takes a lot more work to do because it's not scalable, but um, it has way more throughput. So mm. meaning a higher response rate. So all you do is you take your phone, you use the LinkedIn app, right? Uh, and you just film a quick video. And I'll work on what to say in the video. But ideally, you're going to want to give something to them that's going to be a high value to them. Something that your target market is really going to want. Mm. Really, really important. Otherwise, um, they're going to be like, oh, this is just some spammer. You know, yeah. I don't want this, right? So, for example, like, you know, like, um, you know, if, if I was going to give a freebie, maybe I'll give one of my trades out. Right, so I'll say you know, I'll, I'll film a video. It'd be like I'd be looking right in the camera. It'd be about thirty seconds long. It might be like I'll say, you know, hey, name a line of personalization. 
to make sure they, they know and I actually did, did some homework. And then I'll go into a short little strip, give them some value. And then in my message, I'll, I'll drop the value for them in the actual text, right? So it might sound something like this. Hey, Lise, Marcus Chan here. First off, thanks so much for connecting. Love your She Sales podcast. Love the interview with Marcus Chan there. That's absolutely incredible. Hey, the reason I also want to a quick note is I put together a free training on three steps or an extra $50,000 every single year. I'll drop below. Check it out. Hope you enjoy. Cheers. Super simple. Amazing. Simple like that. Boom. Okay. Mm -hmm. Boom. Now, and then in my text, because sometimes people are, they might watch the video or they're in a place they can't hear. I'll tell you about a quick little message. So that way I can hit them both ways. So a little bit of copy, a little bit of video. Got right, it. So now okay. they could look at hey, the video, boom, it gets one message sent, one notification. Then wait a second. Then I, pay, I put a second message, two notifications. Okay. It makes mm -hmm. them pay attention, right? Yeah. Grabs their eyeballs, right? So now the message might say, you know, hey, Elise, you know, like, thanks so much for connecting. Love your interview. Love your interview. Basically, the same thing I just said in text. Right. Love Got the interview it. with Marcus on your She Sells podcast. Um, you, know, you know, here's, here's the, the free training I mentioned. Hope you enjoy it. Cheers. Wow. Boom. Mm -hmm. They watch that and now they're like, oh, wow, like that was pretty useful. Like that was pretty good. So now they'll consume the content. Maybe, maybe they don't. Doesn't really matter. But now you already cut through the noise. Mm. Okay. And obviously there's like the things you want to make sure your video does really well. It's kind of stuff that we, we talked about, right? It's like, you know, when you're doing podcasts, like looking good on camera, it's like, hey, like, like, are you looking in the camera? Do you have okay lighting? Yeah. Do you sound good? What's your background look like? Like, are you in your kitchen where it's like you got dirty dishes everywhere and you got like garbage everywhere? Or are you in a professional looking environment? Are you dressed the part so when they see you, they see you as professional and not just some spammer, you know, trying to steal your information, sell you crypto somewhere, right? Like you want to make sure <laughs> that you're able to decrease the risk uh, that you're a spammer and increase the value you bring. Amazing. So that's how I'll do videos right there. That's, what, that's how you do that. So if you want to go to content, let me know we'll down in content too, if you want. Oh my gosh, this is so good. Well, I think we'll have you back to talk about content because that's probably a whole cool. separate podcast. And I love that sure. yeah. quick follow-up on the videos. Cause so yeah. now you've got their attention. Yeah. It's like from there, I'm assuming you've got some sort of a follow-up game plan in place, or do you get close to a hundred percent response rate from that? Like, what does that give us in a brief amount as we can? Like what, what happens totally. from there? What are you doing? Cause this is so good. Awesome. Let's just say, yeah. for example, make it, let's make it really simple. Let's do a hyper tactical. Let's say yeah. Monday, you send a connection request. Boom. Personalized and offers, whatever. Maybe they accept it Tuesday. Tuesday, you send that video with that message. Mm. Uh, depending on the level of depth of that, of that freebie that you're giving them, the lead magnet, whatever you want to give them, I would probably wait a couple of days, depending on how, how, how intense it is. Because if it's like a, an hour training, like people are busy. Like, <laughs> like give them at least a couple, a couple of days to digest it. If yeah. it's like a PDF or maybe it's a blog post that's really valuable for them, then, you know, a day is totally fine. Hey, you know, hey, Elise, you know, what'd you think of above? Mm. Smiley face. And everything you write should, it should sound like you're talking. It should be like, if, if you remember the AOL instant messaging days, it's like, boom, that's what it should sound like. Like, I would actually break it up into, uh, Choppy messages intentionally because ah. then they'll get mo 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 uh, multiple notifications. So this it's like hey, little least stuff. send, yeah. right? Mm. I, I might even do hey lowercase, mm. very intentional okay. because then they know it's not automation. I, I'll even intentionally misspell words. So this is like this goes against what a lot of people do, right? Yeah. You know, let's just say, for example, Elise, I know it could be spelled many different ways, as you know, I'm yeah. sure you've had, you've had, you know, I might intentionally, Hey, at least spell incorrectly the first time. Interesting. And say, Oh, sorry. Autocorrect. And then type properly. Oh. How connected now does at least feel? Because I guarantee it's happened to her whole life. Yeah. People also her name wrong. Right. <laughs> this is true. This is so true. Now she's like, dang, this, this trust is building. Hmm. Right. So then again, oh, hey, super sorry, sorry, awkward. at least correct it, you know, like, yeah. what, what did you think of, of the training above? You know, smiley face, throw in an emoji. Remember, you're in the DMs right here. We're, we're making a casual conference. That, that might be two, three messages. They just got hit with message one, message two, message three. If they have the notifications on, they got three things on their iPhone now showing that you message them, right? Yeah. So yeah. you were making them stop and what they're doing, pay attention. Uh. Okay. Now, even if they don't pay, they, they have turned off, but they happen to log in LinkedIn later. Now suddenly in their inbox, you got three, like three, what's that? Let me go check it out. Mm, I love it. So again, this, this is how you start sending out. So it's super simple, right? Uh, and okay. then like, you, if they don't respond at that point, there's a couple different angles you can go. So let's just say that was Wednesday. Um, and then maybe wait a couple of days and 
you know, you, at that point, it depends on what you want to do, but you could like, you should have something in between, but like, I'll probably, if they're posting anything, you want to make sure you're actually engaging on their posts as well. That's, that's key. Okay. Um, that helps build uh, omnipresence with them. And then of course, uh, if you can also email them, you can call them as, if you want as well. If you want to keep it all within the LinkedIn messaging, then you know, maybe Friday, then you could send something else out that could also hook their attention. Right. So what, what would they pay attention to? Is it more value at the point? Uh, if, if maybe they had posted something, then you could say, if you had already commented on it, you know, Haley's love, love that post you did yesterday. That was super insightful about X. Mm. Now you're standing out again. Love it. Oh, by the way, what did you think of that thing I sent you? <laughs> oh. <laughs> like, like, oh, P.S. <laughs> by the way, you know, it's like, wow. Uh. So it becomes this like, this, it's very conversational here, right? So that's why I think the mistake some people make is they say, I want to put a lease into a sequence. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, one, two, three, four, five. You get an idea, but you have to kind of gauge the situation based on the context. Because if I know Elise is really active on LinkedIn, which I know you are, well, I'm going to leverage my, to my ability. I'm going to put a I'm going to hit the notification bell on her profile. So every time she posts, I'm the first person to comment on her post. Mm. I'm going to go on there. I'm going to comment. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to have to be super insightful. I might even share it because nobody shares. Mm. So now Elise is like, Oh my God, who is this person? Like I'm giving so much now. I'm giving all this attention to her that she's like, I feel like I have to give them attention. Uh, hey, what's up? <laughs> what's up, Marcus? <laughs> How's it going? I didn't have a chance to see it yet. Uh, I definitely will check it out soon. Uh, no, that can reply back. No worries. Look for You know, let me know what your thoughts. Chat soon. Super easy, right? You don't need to be pushy. You're just being value. You're being value driven. You're being influential, and you're just being a real human being. Which is so good because whether you're selling to, thank you by the way for breaking this all down. So this is like this is brilliant. Yeah. And it's like whether you're selling to a CEO of a company or you're selling to whoever. It's like people think they're so busy they're not going to want to hear from me. Everyone wants to feel important. It doesn't matter, right. and especially as you're selling to people in higher roles, oftentimes they have nobody telling them they're doing a good job, right? Mm -hmm. They have nobody right. reinforcing them. So you taking the time to see them, to affirm them, to humanize the conversation. It's like at the very least, you're going to have a new fan and more likely than not, you're going to have an opportunity to develop over time. So, well, the, the yeah. truth is when you understand human behavior, you realize at the core of it, everyone's decision is purely based off really one thing, which is status. They only want to maintain or increase your status. Yeah. Very important. So we think about this. This is why if you if you lose your job, a lot of people are like, oh my god, it's the world. The world crumbles because they have this level of status in their mind. Yeah, yeah. That's what happens, right? Hmm. Um, you know, if you when you really dive into, you talk to a CEO of a big company. When you really dive into, them, I'm like, oh yeah, it's cool. I'll, I'll, I'll do this. They want probably power again, status, money, mm -hmm. status, right? So they have things. It's always status. People don't want to decrease in status. This is why people. Well, you know, people want to have their name verified on Facebook, Instagram, yeah, because it's status. That's all it is. Yeah. So people make decisions based on status all the time. So when you recognize that and you realize at the core, bro, most people just want to be seen and heard. Mm. That becomes a wildly powerful tool if you use it properly. Mm. I love it. I love it. This is this is phenomenal. I'd love to have you back at some point to talk about a lot of stuff, but definitely I'd love to hone in on content strategy and what you're doing there. Cause I think whether you're an entrepreneur who's listening or whether you're in, in sales, it's like, we're all our own marketing department these days. Right. True. So Absolutely. it would be amazing to have you back. Tell us, cause I we're, we're close on time. This has been so great. I could, I could have you on for another hour and we wouldn't get done, but, <laughs> but tell us, so tell us first, Marcus, where I've got one final question for you, but where can people connect with you? If they want to learn more, if they want to, this is so valuable. You're going to want to connect with Marcus. So where can everyone find you? Awesome. Cool. So I'll give you two simple, uh, uh, easy places to find me. So number one, head over to sixfiguresalesacademy.com. There's access to all my free trains inside there. And uh, head over to LinkedIn, look up Marcus Chan. It's, uh, it should be one of the first top searches in there. So I'll be inside there as well. Look forward to connecting with all those who uh, listen to this podcast. Amazing. Marcus A. Chan, right? We're That's looking for right. the A. <laughs> a for automation. I love it. <laughs> So final question for you. And, you know, we've, we've got, I was sharing with you in the pre-chat. It's like, obviously this audience, I think skews female, but we've got a really diverse audience that listens. And regardless of who you are, I know you can relate to some of Marcus's story that he shared today 
with us. And so um, for you, Marcus, looking back on your younger self coming up when you didn't have the track record yet, you didn't have the proof that this was going to work. You didn't have the wisdom that you do today. What would you have told that younger Marcus, just getting started off in, in sales and in your business journey? Mm. So um, I'm going to reference a Jim Rohn quote uh, because you know, when I, when I heard this quote a long time ago, this, this really spoke to me and it gave me the clarity on what I needed to do. Um, and, and what Jim Rohn said, he said, if you work hard at your job, you'll make a living. But if you work hard on yourself, you'll make a fortune. Hmm. And that was one of the biggest epiphanies I had, especially early on, um, because early, especially early in my sales career, I was working hard. I was working a lot of hours, but I wasn't necessarily working on becoming the best version of me. And when you, when you realize at the core of it, when you work hard on yourself, it actually multiplies everywhere else because our outer world is a reflection of our inner world. So the better we can work on our inner world, the better our outer world is going to be. You know, as the saying goes, like the fruit is determined by the roots. Mm. So when you really work on the roots, you work on your inner game, it, it, it multiplies every part of your life, not just from like a, a work perspective, but also to your relationships, to how you treat yourself, how you respect yourself, to how you work with other people. So if you understand that and you just work on yourself in every possible facet from mental, physical, emotional, spiritual, and across all the buckets, you will become a better version of yourself. You naturally, as a result, will achieve more success because of that. Mm, it's so good. It's so good. My friend, thank you. This was incredible. I'm so grateful for you coming on, sharing your story, sharing some behind the scenes so people can see like, oh, this is a real person who's been through, you know, <laughs> been through some stuff yeah. and, yeah. and gosh, and, and the tactical too. Like, I just, I'm so grateful for you and, and for everyone listening, please go connect with Marcus, follow him on LinkedIn, check out sixfiguresalesacademy.com. There's so much good stuff there. Uh, we're just super grateful, super, super grateful for you and for your time today. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. All right. Well, to you, my listener, thank you so much for tuning in. I'm super grateful for you. Hey, I know I will speak for both Marcus and myself. We would love if you shared this episode, if it's speaking to you, please take a screenshot um, wherever you're listening, tag Marcus, tag me, let us know your biggest takeaway. I'm always so grateful when you share super grateful to have you as a part of the She Sells community. And I'll see you next week on our next episode of She Sells Radio. Bye for now.